Being with your change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at ChangeLog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash ChangeLog. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean makes it super simple to launch a Kubernetes cluster in minutes. The DigitalOcean Kubernetes platform empowers developers to launch their containerized applications into a managed production-ready cluster without having to maintain or configure the underlying infrastructure. They seamlessly integrate everything with the rest of the DigitalOcean stack, including load balancers, firewalls, object storage spaces, and block storage volumes. They even have built-in support support for public and private image registries like Docker Hub and Quay.io. Developers can now run and scale container-based workloads with ease with the DigitalOcean platform. Learn more and get started for free with a $50 credit at do.co slash changelog. Again, do.co slash changelog. Welcome to GoTime, a podcast featuring a diverse panel and special guests discussing cloud infrastructure, distributed systems, microservices, Kubernetes, Docker, oh, and also Go. We record live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, New Pacific. Join the community of Slack with us in real time during the show in the GoTime FM channel in Go for Slack. Follow us on Twitter. We're at GoTime FM. Listen live at changelaw.com slash live or subscribe at changelaw.com slash GoTime. And now on to the show. Hello and welcome to GoTime. I'm Matt Raya. Today we're talking about graph databases. Joining me, it's Johnny Borsico. Hello, Johnny. Hello, Matt. We're also joined by Jana Bidogan. Hello, Jana. Hello. How are you? Good. Welcome back. It's been a while. It's been quite a while. Yes. Well, it's good to have you back. We're also joined by a special guest. It's only Frances Campoy. Hello, Frances. Hey, how's it going? How are you? Pretty good. That was a decent pronunciation of my name. Oh, <laughs> thank you. That uh, means a lot. Um, well, I'd like to start with the, one of the first questions that gets asked every time I mention you is from uh, Pontus on Slack asks, when is Just for Funk coming back? Mm. Uh, eventually. Right. It's eventually. <laughs> cool. Eventually. Yeah, eventually coming back. Maybe next year. Maybe. Do you need Do you need help? I need yeah. I need extra time. That's the only thing I need. <laughs> no, but now I finally moved to a new house and everything. I'm settling down, and I will have a little studio, so I'll be able to start again. I now just need the energy. So you know, couple <laughs> months, couple months of relaxing, and then back. Great. For anyone who doesn't know, which is probably nobody, there's a great <laughs> video series that Francesc does called Just for Funk. Um, which, and I, I, I'm fine that you picked that name. I suggested Go Funk Yourself. I <laughs> uh, didn't like that one. Yeah, you know, back, back then I used to work at Google. Not sure how that would have been accepted. <laughs> uh, yeah. f- funk that. So today we're going to we're going to talk about graph databases and this is a, a really interesting area and it's feels very new and we're going to dig into that a little bit more but maybe we could start off with a simple overview Francesc of like what you're doing and and then we can go into what what actually is a graph database yeah, so uh, I mean, I can talk a little bit about how I got involved with graph databases. So um, after I left Google, I joined this company, Source, where uh, I started doing code analysis. And when you think about it, like if you think about how you parse code, you end up with a with a tree, right? A syntactic tree. Uh, and the idea is once you start adding annotations on top, like this function is calling the code in there, or this variable was declared up there, or this is the type of whatever. Uh, you start having like a graph, right? And then you think about how are you going to store this and you look up relational databases and uh, it's a bad match. Uh, It doesn't really work, it's super hard to do. And as soon as you start adding more things, it just breaks the schema needs to be very, um, it's it's too strict, right? So then you go into NoSQL databases and then uh, you have the issue of 
how much do you re replicate, right? Like, do you want to replicate the same information over a bunch of times for performance, but then you need to take a, a, into account the consistency, or do you want to put everything into little pieces, but then it's going to be super slow. And uh, that's when I started looking into graph databases. And, you know, you're right, it sounds like it's somehow new. Um, that said, how, how old do you think Neo4j is? Ooh, that's a good one. Johnny, what do you think? I'd say at least 10 years. It is, if I'm not mistaken, 19 years old. Wow. wow. Yeah. So, you know, it, they, they've, been, they've been going at it for a while. Uh, they can so nearly drink. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> in Spain, it can definitely, it can definitely drink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. And so, so it's not a completely new technology, but... Uh, you know, it's it's something that has been evolving over time, little by little. And and I started looking around, and there's not that many graph databases, uh, actually, like pure graph databases, databases that have a graph layer. There's a bunch of them. There's uh, there's you know like a, a bunch of different competitors, etc. But the problem is that storing things as a graph is actually something not that easy to do, and it's something that brings a lot of flexibility. Because the idea is that instead of having to, you know, it's like if you think about a graph, let's say, you know, uh, Twitter, the people that you follow and like the tweets and like the tags and hashtags and all that stuff, right? If, if you store that in a graph database, the same way you would draw it in a, in a whiteboard, that's what you store, right? You store nodes and you store relationships. And that's pretty much it. Uh, as soon as you need to start thinking about, oh, how do I model this so it fits my database? you are adding complexity from the point of view of like the developer, like you need to think about these things, right? Which, which is an important cost. People do not take that into account, but you know, complexity that you add to your system means that once you, you're going to start debugging, it's going to be harder to debug because there's extra layers of abstraction. Uh, and then on the other side is also performance wise, uh, the way you're going to be able to retrieve things. If you need to do transformations, like if you think about, a relational database and it, and we have like people that follow people, right? If I tell you, oh, find all the people that follow, like uh, all the people that I follow and then their followers and then their followers or something like that, right? Like you're going to go quite deep. Uh, it's going to be a bunch of different requests. And this is what people call the N plus one problem. The idea of if I fetch something and then I want to fetch something related to those things that I just fetched, you don't have to do a query. Get with start with the, that data set and then for every single item in the data set do one more query and it keep, keeps multiplying so it doesn't really scale so you know it's like the idea of graph databases is solving that problem specifically and uh, so I started looking around and uh, I decided to join the graph partly you know uh, the raining go which is kind of cool <laughs> I think that uh, people might, might like go in this in this podcast and also it's completely open source it's distributed and it's also in San Francisco, which is nice because they didn't want to travel that much. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's interesting then. And, and I want to talk more about this later, but you said it's, distri it's distributed. Yeah. Um, because my, so I, as I understood it, one of the things that makes graph databases quick is that it's kind of all stored in the format that it, like you don't, it doesn't, it doesn't get transformed very much, does it? It's kind of stored in the format that that you then use it with. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the whole idea, like uh, there's this term that uh, people like to throw around, even though most people do not really understand what it means. It's called index free adjacency and index free adjacency just means that when you uh, actually, uh, there's a very good metaphor that I like to use. So, you know, uh, in index free adjacency, uh, when I'm, so imagine that I, I, I'm, I'm Francesc and I'm trying to go to someone's house. I just know their address and go there, right? That is index-free adjacency. I, you just have all the information for the beginning. Mm -hmm. While in normal databases, the way it's going to work is I have a key that allows me to go check it out, where this information is, and then you go find it, right? So it's more like I go to some place, like a phone book or something, where I find this is the name of the person, I can find the address, and then go get it, right? So that extra step, that, that is a little bit the main difference of how things are stored. But at the end of the day, uh, the way we store data, it's key value, right? Like it's just a key value store uh, that is extra fancy with a bunch of things on top and raft, pro raft consensus protocols and things like that, right? But the way we store things at the end of the day, just key values. 
And the distributed part of things is the fact that you know mo uh, many databases, uh, Neo4j is one, one example, they, in order to be efficient, they need to store everything in the same machine, right? Uh, at dgraph, what we do is instead we, we partition data set by, by the predicate, right? So say there are many predicates like name or age or friends, those, that information is separate. So we're gonna store it in potentially different machines. Not necessarily, like you can run all of everything in the same machine, but it could be potentially in multiple machines. And the idea is that by, by uh, separating the data like that, no matter how much data you're fetching, uh, the number of phone, of, uh, phone calls, I guess I can say, the, the, the number of network requests that you're sending is proportional to the number of predicates that you're fetching, not the amount of data. So it scales really well. Otherwise, if you end up partition any, in any other way, at least the ones that we have tried, you end up with, as you go with more data, you end up having to send queries to all of the computers that are involved, and then that kills performance again. Can I ask a more fundamental question? Because I think I'm super unqualified to be on this podcast. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so compared to, for example, like column-based DBs, like what is the overall, you know, underlying storage structure for a graph DB in in the same node? Like, let's say, like yeah. everything is just like on one machine. Yeah. So, uh, it, I mean, it's kind of cool because we use an open source project that was also created by DGraph. It's called Badger. Uh, and it's the thing. It's the project that gives name to our mascot, which is Badger, Digit Badger. Uh, and this, this is just a key value store, right? So uh, you're storing. Uh, it, it actually works with. Uh, so it's a key value store. So you could think about like you know SSDs and things like that, like sorted string tables and all that stuff that we use at Google. But the idea is that. From a high, point, high level point of view, you just have keys and values. The way this is actually implemented internally, it's an LSTM, which it's a log structure tree. Ah, uh, what it was. Uh, <laughs> log structure tree. Merge. Merge. merge tree. Yes, merge tree. It's, it's a, I, I always mix it with LSTM with long, short term memory, which is an AI thing. So it's, <laughs> it's just, make, uh, I mix everything. Uh, but yeah, like this structure, what it allows you to do is to have a very good insert time and also very good uh, retrieval time. So it's just, you know, a different kind of tree that we use. And uh, if you ever heard about RocksDB, it's yep. somehow similar to RocksDB. Uh, the two biggest difference is one, the values are not stored inside of the tree which means that it's more efficient from the point of view of storage. And also uh, when you're iterating over keys, it's much faster because you don't need to fetch the values. And then the second one, which is more important, it's actually written in Go. And uh, that for us was very important because otherwise we had to use Seago. And Seago is great, but not really necessarily performing. So it was actually important to be able to, to have something that was wor working natively in Go. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just a fancy key value store at the end. So one of the examples we've already sort of touched on um, is sort of the, the social graph, right? Because that's yeah. an easy sort of thing to wrap your head around. I'm interested to hear what some of the, basically the uncommon sort of examples that you've come across, right? Or, or DGraph has come across, maybe it's customer base, basically for, for, for using this type of technology. What is it really, really good at beyond just social graph? So yeah, social graphs is the traditional example because as soon as you talk, you know, about graphs, people's like, oh, uh, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all mm -hmm. that stuff, uh, which is great. Like it actually works really well for those use cases. Uh, but in general, uh, that is a kind, uh, uh, a class of uh, knowledge graphs, right? Like graphs where you're storing information. Uh, so for instance, dgraph uh, actually comes from technology developed at Google. Uh, I think that internally the project was also called dgraph, which is weird, but it's okay because Google never uses the internal name externally or something like that. So it, it was cool. But yeah, like it is the same technology. And the idea is when you're storing information for, you know, like movies and actors and a lot of stuff, like if you think about the, the I think it's called one box, uh, which is when you search something and you have on the right side of the search, like this extra information, telling you like, oh, the actor and the movies they've been in and stuff like that, that actually is served by a graph, right? So the idea is in order to store that information and being able to retrieve things quite easily, graphs are the best way to do it. But then uh, on top of that, that knowledge graph could be something that changes really fast. We've seen people doing knowledge graphs on, or it's more like a visibility layer more than anything on top of Kubernetes, right? So you have, 
if you think about Kubernetes, you have services and, and pods and all of these things. They're all related in many different ways, right? Like there are tags, there are like traffic and like services sending things around. Uh, you can visualize that inside of uh, Kubernetes, inside of a, a graph database, and then query things like, hey, what are the things that could impact this service, right? If this service goes down or the other way around, right? Like if this service goes down, what pieces of my system will be impacted? And that is a graph problem. Uh, there's actually an open source project created by VMware. It's called um, Purser, P-U-R-S-E-R, Purser, I think. But yeah, uh, and there's many others. There's things like actually geographic graphs. So uh, we, we have geo, uh, uh, geolocation. So you can do things like find all of the hotels that are, uh, you know, at less than 50 miles from downtown of San Francisco and then from there do more graph stuff. So you can you can go quite deep into um, finding things about your data set that otherwise it, it's just very hard, right? Because if you think about all of these queries, you can you could definitely do them anywhere, right? Like you could do them on a on a normal database, on a relational database. The problem is that it's going to be way, way slower. So it's just, I don't know if you've ever used uh, BigQuery. Uh, with BigQuery, you end up like writing queries that run across terabytes of data. And it's not about the fact that it's easier to write. It's just that short developer loop uh, that uh, it's it just much better. You get the feedback and you keep on playing. Uh, while, you know, if you need to wait for five minutes, it's gonna be way, way slower and more painful. And then, yeah, one of the data set that, uh, one other uh, use case that we see very often is since there's no need for a schema, you can actually integrate a bunch of different data sets together very easily. So data set integration or data set unification uh, happens pretty often. So if you see like, imagine you have a really large, you know, telecom company that has been acquiring different companies. And for every single one of those companies acquired, probably there's a user base, right? There's, there's an account database with a bunch of different things. And what you want to do is being able to integrate all of those systems together into one. Uh, graph databases are great for that. If you think about how would you do it with a relational database, the number of foreign keys that are going to be flying around is going to be pain, right? So th that kind of thing is also very useful. It's very simple. It works really well. So you talked earlier about indexes, and this is kind of uh, doesn't have the uh, same kind of pattern because, like in, I was playing around recently with Firestore, which is hmm. the Firebase uh, schemaless data. And if you if you do queries um, that that you haven't done before, you actually get an error, and it says I can't serve this because there's no index that matches yeah. the order of those fields or whatever the filter is you're doing. And so you kind of have to know in advance what you're going to be asking of this database. Is that different in graph databases by because of its nature? So not necessarily, uh, the whole idea is indexes are not necessary to traverse relationships, right? So if I start from a given node, going around that node will not require an index. The place where you might need an index is to find that first node. The whole idea is that while you will not need indexes to traverse relationships, you might still need indexes to find those first initial nodes that you're going to use to start your, tra your uh, traversal. And uh, there's a bunch of different things. Like for instance, if you want to find all of the orders, all of the products that have been ordered by a given user, right? All of that does not require an index, but actually finding the user from their username, that will require one. So you do have indexes, right? And those indexes need, need to be built. So they will not be built until you, you ask for them. But uh, the idea of using dgraph, I'm actually not that sure about all the, all the graph databases, but for dgraph at least, the way it works is that you start just using, you, you start inserting data. You don't care about the schema, but there's a schema. There's a schema that is being created as you go. And then if you try to do a query that requires an index and it's not there, it will indeed fail and tell you, hey, you need to build this. You click a button, now you have an index. And then the idea is that while you're developing, that schema is gonna evolve over time. And then at the end, that schema is something that you're actually going to put in your source code, right? Say, okay, this is the schema that I'm gonna be using. And then when you set it in production, normally what I recommend is uh, there's a strict mode for mutation. So when you're putting new data, you can actually say, hey, if, there's, if that data does not follow the schema that I already have, reject it, right? It, it's a much safer way to do it. Uh, 
for development, I think that free like schema schema free schema less uh, databases is great. But then as soon as you get in production, I'd be a little bit more careful with that. <laughs> I had the same thing. I used to do MongoDB stuff. And it was the same, like when I first had, I, I couldn't believe that I didn't need to think about schemas. I can just do anything. And actually documents don't even have to look yeah. the same or even similar. And that freedom just felt so powerful. And then as, once I'd built a few things, I realized I could really use some <laughs> errors <laughs> about now. Yeah, so the idea for us, right, is that you have, you, you can start with no schema at all, but we also have a type system on top. So the idea is you start adding things and then you're going to say, oh, this node has this type and this type is supposed to have these fields. It doesn't mean they have the fields. It just means that they should, right? So if you have a person, you could say it's supposed to have a name and an age. So then when you're fetching things, you're going to say fetch all the fields of type person or things like that, right? So you can actually have a type system on top and that is something completely optional, right? So you can start from paying zero attention to the data you're storing in your database, see how it goes, end up with a schema, and then from that schema that contains all of the kinds of, all of the predicates or all the kind of information that you stored, name, age, friends, all of those things, then you're gonna go and say, okay, is this actually the type that I want? Do I need indexes on this? So like a username, I'm gonna find exact, or I'm gonna use hash for to find these things, and then group those in, into types, and then you can start doing more like advanced things. And the cool thing is that once you get there, then you can present that uh, we have a GraphQL layer. So then you can actually start sending, sending queries in GraphQL to your graph database, which makes it so, you know, front end engineers are much, much happier when you tell them that they can use GraphQL instead of having to learn a new language one more. How often do you think about internal tooling? I'm talking about the back office apps, the tool the customer service team uses to access your databases, the S3 uploader you built last year for the marketing team, that quick Firebase admin panel that lets you monitor key KPIs, and maybe even the tool that your data science team had together so they could provide custom ad spend insights. Literally every line of business relies upon internal tooling, but if I'm being honest, I don't know many engineers out there who enjoy building internal tools, let alone getting them excited about maintaining or even supporting them. And this is where Retool comes in. Companies like DoorDash, Brex, Plaid, and even Amazon, they use Retool to build internal tooling super fast. The idea is that almost all internal tools look the same. They're made of tables, dropdowns, buttons, text inputs, and Retool gives you a point, click, drag and drop interface that makes it super simple to build these types of interfaces in hours, not days. Retool connects to any database or API, for example, to pull data from Postgres, just write a SQL query and drag and drop a table onto the canvas. And if you want to search across those fields, add a search input bar and update your query, save it, share it. It's too easy. Retool is built by engineers explicitly for engineers. And for those concerned about data security, Retool can even be set up on premise in about 15 minutes using Docker, Kubernetes, or Heroku. Learn more and try it free at retool.com slash changelog. Again, retool.com slash changelog. Is there any additional cost of um, going completely schemaless because, you know, the indexes are going to be affected in like hmm. how rebuilding the index kind of works if you change the schema? Uh, is this one of the reasons that like on production you want to actually lock, this, lock the schema? So not necessarily, I'd say, uh, so the idea is that you can change your schema as you go, right? Like it's totally fine. Uh, if you are a schema, if you're an index to something that didn't have an index, it will be computer on the fly and it's fine. It's really fast also. But if you have terabytes of data, it might take a couple of minutes. During those minutes, you will not be able to change your data. You will be able to only retrieve data, but not do mutations, right? Uh, which is fine. But the idea is while you're doing the development, you're actually working normally with a smaller data set. And at that point, it's great because then you can click and it's basically instantaneous, right? So mm -hmm. while you're developing that developer experience of schemaless, I really like it, right? Like it's somehow like when you're writing in a, you're writing code and you're writing in Python, 
the fact that you can just put things together and it just works like that is great. But at the same time, when I'm going to production, I want to have a little bit more like rigidity and make sure that the schema is working for me. So I'm going to start adding things that will make it so if I do something wrong, which is totally possible, I will be uh, I will be notified, right? Some error, even if it's just a log or warning or something like that, is much better than silently failing, right? So yeah, that's a little bit the idea of, of why I want, like, I like the schema less and it's super useful, but one thing on production, I'd rather be, you know, it's like, I'd rather be writing Go with a decent type system than be writing C, uh, that, and I will end up having weird things happening if I'm doing something wrong. Right. Yeah, I have it's zero just like, trust in me. <laughs> it really happened to me when I was working like uh, with you know document DBs. Um, since there's no schema, I would just like end up like having all these like embedded you know types like embedded like objects. Um, so you can just like end up like just really doing a lot of things wrong and like um, if especially like the references are like referring like large objects or whatever. Everything kind of like just gets into the database. So it's kind of nice to have that like option to you know restrict it to a schema yeah i've i've had issues where uh after debugging for 10 minutes i realized that the the data i was storing had a typo in the name of the field <laughs> and that took me forever so you know i was like that is the kind of thing i just don't want it to happen i just if i can avoid that much better for me so yeah that's that's why like having a schema that is yeah that's optionally enforced makes a lot of sense yeah I'm trying to wrap my relational modeling head around sort of not having to have a schema and that's that's proving quite hard for me. So <laughs> like h- how how do you model relationships that are not just like oh this you know piece is connected to this other piece by some sort of loose relationship between them. How do I model things like actual relationships, right? Yeah. Maybe I have I have a, an invoice with line items on it, right? These This is kind of like a parent-child relationship. You can't have the line item just floating out and about. It, it belongs to something, right? It doesn't have meaning without the sort of a, the, the, the parent relationship, mm-hmm. right? So how do you model these kinds of things? Or rather, do you have to throw that sort of approach out you know, the door, leave it at the door before you enter the world of schemaless and the world of graph databases. I mean, you don't really need to get rid of all of the concepts that you have from before, especially if you're coming from a document database. Uh, if you come from a document database, imagine getting, instead of having a document that is just a big JSON, you basically explode that into, you know, uh, instead of having an object that has name and age and then po- a friends that points to an array of people that have name and age, you're going to explode that into little facts. So you're going to say, this ID has name, Francesc, and then age, whatever, and then friends is a list of different IDs, and then those IDs also have their name and age. So you're going to break that into, into triplets, right? Like triplet is uh, subject, no, wait, uh, yeah, subject, verb, and object, right? So you're saying things about things, and that's what you store at the end, right? Like you literally store just that. So uh, once you take that into account, you realize that all of the order, all of the ordering that you had is gone. So then if you have something like an, an order with items and you want those items to be stored in, in some way, in, in a specific order, then you actually need to store that there, right? You need to say that uh, the order, like, and, and you, have, you, you have different ways of doing this. You can create something like the way you would do it in a, in a, in a traditional relational database where you're going to have like these item line table that points to both the order and the and the product that they have and then also has like the in the item number in there or something right there's a way to do it but for us you could do it just as a node itself is a node which is something similar to what you would uh, think about uh, the, the relational database or you can also attach things you can attach data to the relationships themselves so you could say this item belongs to this order and that relationship, you're tagging it saying it's item order number one. So there's, a, there's, there's multiple places where you can store that kind of information. And it's the whole idea is very flexible, so you can do whatever you want, which means that you need to be a little bit more strict about like You need to really think about how do you store this. And that's why having a schema is going to help you with those things. But at the end of the day, um, what we see is people modeling in a very in the most straightforward way possible, like simplifying as, as much as possible. And then they start sending queries and they start to see, 
okay, this is the performance issues I'm hitting, because depending on what the way you're storing data, uh, you're gonna get more or, more or less performance, right? So that's when you start tuning your database. But you know, in general, I'd say that just storing the data the most natural way possible has it is the best way to go. Because you know, it's like when you're writing Go, right? Like you're not supposed to be thinking about cache locality right away. If you're doing that, your code's gonna be really ugly, right? Write code that makes sense to you and to, that makes sense to everyone, that is easy to maintain. And then if we need to find a hack somewhere to fix it and make it much faster, then let's do that then, but not, be, not, not from the beginning. And for data modeling, I would say it's the same. Find something that is obvious and very clear. And if that doesn't work, first, file an issue, right? <laughs> Let us know, like, because <laughs> maybe there's an issue or something like that. But also at that point, we're gonna start looking into performance tuning and you know doing actual debugging and figuring out how much data are we fetching? Because sometimes, you know, it may be something as silly as like, oh, you're actually not using this index and instead of loading one item, you're actually loading all of your database. That's not good, right? So that is the kind of thing that you need to look into as you're writing your thing. But data modeling should be as uh, straightforward and as natural as possible. Because at the end of the day, you're gonna, you're gonna have to maintain that over time. So if you start getting smart, you're gonna, need to be at least as smart as you are now in a month, which I'm not convinced I can. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good point. <laughs> so uh, along, along those lines, like, it, it, would you say, in my experience, you, you can go pretty far, you know, with a relational database uh, um, before you start noticing, you know, that, you, oh, I didn't have the proper, you know, index and in the right hmm. column, you know, like, you, you can kind of go far, right, before you realize, okay, I have to do something about this. I have, I have a problem with my actual uh, um, data and how it's being stored. Like, it sounds like with, with you know, uh, key value stores, with, with uh, graph databases, you kind of have to put a bit more sort of a forethought into how you structure your data, like where it goes, how you're going to shard and things like that. that I would true? actually, it's the other way around. I, I would say huh. that uh, graph databases the, and, and document databases too, right? Like the fact that the schema is so flexible makes it so eventually, like you, you go for the simplest way. And if you then need to migrate to something else because you find something that was not uh, taken into account from the beginning, you can, right? It is actually doing transformations in the data and everything. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, while if you think about uh, relational database, right? Like I have this example of, you know, uh, you have a movie and director. And what you're saying is a movie has a director. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the movie, a foreign key pointing to the director that directed that movie. Right. And you're like, great. You start working on that. And then you figure out that guess what? There's movies that have multiple directors and now you need to refactor your database. And that is hard. Because the way you're storing the whole thing, it's going to be much harder to move out into different pieces. You're going to need to come up with a new concept, movie director or something like that is somehow in between because now you go from one to many to many to many, right? So all of those things are way harder to do. While for us, if you say, oh, this is a one to, one to many relationship, and then it's like, oh, ne never mind, was many to many. It's literally just changing the, the type of the predicate in one place. That's it. Migration wise, I think it's much easier. The... The whole idea is that you get to make those decisions once you have the information that you need to make those decisions, rather than from mm. the beginning and trying to get it right. So that's, that has a massive development advantage because actually, I think we sort of fool ourselves into thinking we can design these things perfectly in the beginning and then we just, then there's an implementation phase or whatever. And it's never like that. You learn so much by doing it that actually being able to be adaptive and to migrate the data and things becomes very, uh, very valuable. Um, Andy Walker in the Slack channel, Andy Walker's my new uh, Twitter enemy. Um, <laughs> he was asking about um, what that switch, what the switch between dev mode and prod mode kind of looks like. He asks, do I need a corpus of seed data that represents everything I care about? And then sort of clear that out in some way, and and you know snapshot it or something. What's the what's the actual process there? So so the way I normally do this, uh, and there's different options, but the idea is that while you while you're inserting data uh, into the database, uh, by default you can insert any data, and everything will be accepted, right? So you start putting things in there, and it's going to be creating as you go a schema. So say I store something saying my name is Francesc, it's gonna store something saying, oh, there's a thing called name 
and it points to a type, and maybe it guesses a string if you send it as JSON, or if you send it as an RDF, it's gonna say it's default. We don't know what it is, but you can store things in there, right? Uh, as you go, you're gonna start uh, tuning that up and saying, actually, you know, name is, it needs to be a string. And not only that, but also gonna need an index, right? Or then you get age and you get whatever, and you keep on adding more and more data as you go. The whole idea is that eventually you have all of the data that you need that is already in that schema. And then on top of that, you also have designed uh, your database with all of the indexes that you need to do the queries that you're gonna need to do, right? At that point, that schema that has been created automatically, you can literally copy paste it into your code and call it, you know, like dgraph.schema. And now what you're gonna do is when you start your program, if the database didn't exist, right? Like it's a completely blank database, you're gonna send that schema and then lock it and say, okay, from now on, this schema is not allowed to change. So if I want to send data that matches that, that's totally fine. But if you try to send data that instead of name, it uses first name, which is not something I'd said that you could use, it will just reject it. So that's the idea of, it, it is literally just, uh, when you start the database, you have this, this switch that says, uh, it's the serving mode, and it's serving mode this standard or strict, and the other one is completely nothing. You cannot mutate anything. You cannot change the data. It's like you get a, a, a read-only database. So it's somewhere in between. You can write things, but you cannot modify the, your, your schema. Just because you mentioned read-only databases, is there any sort of like replication of data? Uh, can I have like multiple read nodes, for example, and have like one write node or? Yeah, so that's actually, uh, that's a very good point. Uh, so dgraph, the D stands for distributed, right? So the idea is that uh, you, you are supposed to be running multiple servers for every single uh, function. So it is designed so it doesn't have any uh, single point of failure. And it follows a lot with, if you think about how Kubernetes works, so you have multiple replicas and those replicas in a group, they host the same information, right? They, they do the same thing. And we use Raft to decide which one is the leader. If one of them dies, we don't care. There's like, if you have three of them, right? Like one of them dies, you still have quorum, you have two of them, the database is gonna continue working. And then once it comes back, it's going to be uh, notified, hey, you're part of this group, this is the data that you, you should be serving, right? So it catches up. So uh, the data will be replicated. But on top of that, if that, the amount of data that you have doesn't fit in a single machine, then you can start adding more groups and then the data will be sharded across all of those groups. But again, uh, they will have their own replicas and everything, so you're gonna have like what we call alphas, which are the servers that, host the, that, uh, that hold the data. You can have as many groups as you want, and in every group, you, can, you normally have three or five replicas, depending on the uh, availability expectations that you have. And then the same for uh, the zeros, and the zero is actually basically like the, uh, I think it's called Kubernetes master or something like that, right? Like the controller that manages the whole cluster, that one also, we don't have one, you can replicate and have three. So if one goes down, still the, the cluster is working. Yeah, as you mentioned earlier, GraphQL. Um, and I've seen GraphQL implementations that I was surprised to learn was kind of just, it was backed by Postgres. Yeah. Uh, but the interface is GraphQL. Um, and like you said, JavaScript developers love that because, I mean, I think, you know, the, the, there's something nice about being able to specify exactly the kind of data that you want back and nothing more. And also in quite a natural way, because the GraphQL is kind of a JSON format, yeah. JSON-ish. Um, so what do you think about that, having the graph interface into traditional databases? So I think that GraphQL is a great alternative to REST. Like I really sincerely like it. Uh, it. It makes it so there's a schema. So when you're requesting things, you know what you're allowed to be requesting, but also at the same time, you also have not only the data, but also operations. So you have mutations and queries and things like that. So it's kind of like a nice modern way of doing gRPC. Like if you've ever used gRPC where you have the data, which is represented as protocol buffers, but then you also have all of the different um, services. They're called services. Yeah, yeah, all the different services, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the similar idea for GraphQL, right? So, so that I like it a lot. That said, the problem is that it's a beautiful abstraction that is super hard not to make it leak, right? Like if you have. <laughs> Uh, if you have a very beautiful abstraction of, oh, it's all one graph, right? Like, 
everything is a graph, everything, you're just gonna use everything as graphs. Okay, first problem, authentication, huh, fun, right? Like, <laughs> if you start considering these things, there's actually many, many issues of implementing that in a very natural way. Uh, there's a lot of adapters. Uh, so, you know, like Prisma, Apollo, and uh, Hasura are examples of different companies that provide adapters on top of existing databases. Uh, that is great, right? Because it means that you can create a GraphQL layer on top of your uh, old system, and then eventually, little by little, start replacing things and say, oh, you know, these are going to move it to this uh, more GraphQL native environment, or I'm going to break this monolith into microservices and just uh, federation on top. Like all of these things work and they're very useful. That said, every single time I go to a GraphQL summit, people talk about the same issues of caching the N plus one problem. But like if you're fetching a lot of information uh, and you're based on top of, you know, a relational database, you're fetching all the data in the table, uh, basically no matter what. So you're gonna be fetching that information and then from there, you're gonna get a lot of data and then before you send it, oh, guess what? Like on top of customers, now I want to get all the orders. So you're gonna need to get those IDs and go down and get the information for the orders and then go down again. So it's like that M plus one problem and then in order to fix it, there's things like prefetching some things and like basically playing with caches and things like that. And it becomes really rough. It yeah. is, it, I mean, it works, uh, which is great, but it is, it is hard to understand and hard to, even harder to debug, right? Uh, so, so that's why I was like, when it's for us, for DGRAPH, right? Like uh, GraphQL, is, it was super easy to adapt because uh, our previous language that we support and we will support for a long time, it's GraphQL plus minus because it's more or less GraphQL. And uh, it's basically GraphQL, but adding up some extra things to make it a better query language for a database and then removing something that didn't make that much sense, right? So gra adopting GraphQL was super easy. It's basically the same language. And now what we're doing is figuring out how can we bring the things that we added that make the language incompatible with GraphQL how can we add them back to GraphQL in a compatible way? And there are ways, it's super interesting actually, it's like a lot of language design and APIs, but like inside of GraphQL, uh, super cool. Just because you mentioned debugging, um, in relational d databases, for example, there's a huge culture around like, you know, analysis tools, uh, they can like anal analyze your query and so on. Do you have anything hmm. for the graph? So not right now, we're actually working on uh, having a, a query planner uh, right now, the only places, like the thing is that the way the data is structured, query planners do not make that much sense, except on how you use indexes, right? Mm -hmm. So that is where we're starting working, because uh, sometimes using the index is not necessarily the best way to do it. Uh, if you, it's basically like you know, if they have, you have joins of two tables in relational databases. Uh, if one of them is much smaller than the other, there's better operations that you can do than just doing the full join, right? So it's kind of the same idea of like, depending on the size of the data sets, sometimes using an index is better. Sometimes just going and iterating over all the items might be faster. So that's a little bit the, the kind of thing we were looking into. Uh, that said, we and in the latest version uh, that we published, we have an extra, a new thing that allows you to have an idea of how many nodes have been fetched, how many keys, have, how many, how much data from the disk uh, you had to, to get, how many uh, network calls you had to go through. And then on top of that, I'm sure you'll love it, Yana, uh, we have uh, open sensors absolutely everywhere. <laughs> so yeah, so it's like tracing. Congratulations. App. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it is, it, it works surprisingly well. Like uh, when, you, when you go into like, okay, so this is slow, what is going on? And you just open open census and you can see all of the traces hitting the different machines, hitting the disk and say, this, this was really slow. What is going on in here, right? Like that makes it so, you know, the tooling that we're developing on top will be useful for the end user but for any uh, a knowledgeable person that already knows open census, there's a lot already in there. Thanks, mm -hmm. you know, open source. It's, so it's also great. yeah a knowledge tool. I really like distributed traces as a knowledge tool. Uh, even you can probably like, it's so hard for everyone on the team to understand everything end to end. So like they can just basically, you know, use distributed traces to learn more about their project, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's also something that, you know, is like that is, uh, where I enjoy having uh, control from, you know, if you, let's say you, you're serving a GraphQL layer, right? You have GraphQL, 
that is uh, transforming into things that are sent to the alphas and then talk to the zeros and then go to Badger and get some from, f something from an SSD. We own all of that code. So we're able to put open census across the whole thing and have a very clear view of what's going on. That's if you try to do something like that with an adapter and you have like an adapter over some other database, actually that integration is going to be super hard. So, you know, yeah. the, the fact that we simplify everything and everything is kind of like built by us, it's everything in Go, everything open census, every, everything, I'm going to go with the word cloud native, right? Like the idea of <laughs> everything is supposed to be running continuously. Uh, and if something crashes, whatever, just restart it and keep going, right? All of those things make it. So at the end of the day, it is much easier to use because there's, there's fewer moving pieces. Somebody on Twitter the other day said Kubernetes was basically turning things off and on again at scale. Yeah, <laughs> and it works. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by GoCD. With native integrations for Kubernetes and a Helm chart to quickly get started, GoCD is an easy choice for cloud native teams. With GoCD running on Kubernetes, you define your build workflow and let GoCD provision and scale build infrastructure on the fly for you. GoCD installs as a Kubernetes native application, which allows for ease of operations, easily upgrade and maintain GoCD using Helm, scale your build infrastructure elastically with a new elastic agent that uses Kubernetes conventions to dynamically scale GoCD agents. GoCD also has first class integration with Docker registries, easily compose, track, and visualize deployments on Kubernetes. Learn more and get started at gocd.org slash Kubernetes. Again, gocd.org slash Kubernetes. We should talk a bit about what you wouldn't use a graph database for as well, no. because it, it, you know, it's, I mean, I think a lot of our listeners and I certainly will be doing this. I'm going to go and play with this now because I want to really see, because I still, I still don't have a kind of full understanding of, um, hmm. from, from the, what we've talked about really, what this actually can do and what it feels like when you use it. But are there, are there problems where you just would, wouldn't even uh, think of using a graph database? I mean, we're, the way we built DGraph was uh, with, uh, you know, like general use cases in mind, right? Like you're storing data, like the same way you're using a, a document database. Uh, document databases, you can you can use them for basically everything, right? So it's, it's a very general field. Uh, we're trying to make it so, you know, you can have graph algorithms and, and fancy things, but at the same time, the normal use case of just storing data and then like getting it back and making sure that everything is stable and performant, that's what we're going for. That said, there are things like uh, if you're doing uh, uh, time series data, right? Mm. Is there are much better, much uh, more efficient solutions for this because you know it's a very specific field that has amazing solutions, right? So time series is one of those. Uh, I would say analytics is something that we're able to do depending on how much data you're throwing at it, right? Like uh, if you're doing analytics in real time, I think that DGraph is actually really good for that. If you're doing analytics on larger data that you're basically batching and just going over it, uh, all the data at the same time, you know, BigQuery is great, right? Like why would you, like re-implementing that is gonna be really hard. So some tools are gonna be better at some specific use cases. Uh, I do think that people still have a very um, uh, clear tendency to use relational databases for everything. And relational databases are really great for, you know, when you need to fetch a lot of information that it's always the same schema and things like that. Unfortunately, that's not the case that often. And, you know, uh, relational databases are somehow quite bad at storing relations, even though, you know, it's in the name. Uh, it, they're not really good at that. North and Korea it, is called the Democratic <laughs> People's Republic of North Korea. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we are cancelled in North Korea. Oops. Oh, no. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Oh. So much. <laughs> so much, at least someone in North Korea had sense of humor, you know. That's something. <laughs> yeah. No, but like, uh, it, it, is, it is hard to manage manage relations in a relational database sometimes. And uh, that's why people enjoy mm, document databases. It just makes it easier. You just store your data and that's it. And I think that graph databases 
could be, you know, somehow like a substitute for document databases that is going to scale much better. So, so that's where I think it could go. Yeah. Do you think that people are going to end up with um, running kind of different types of database in some cases? Still having, I mean, probably if people are transitioning or if a team thinks yeah. this is a perfect use case for this, but we still have this existing system that we have to live with because you can't, you're not allowed to just delete everything and start again sometimes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you imagine that, that there's going to be situations where you would actually have your relational database or whatever your existing data store already is still running, but you also maintain the, the graph for those extra special specific cases? Yeah, that's actually something that we see pretty often uh, where, you know, you already have a very large data set. And what you want to do is not get rid of that because you already have so many programs, so many uh, systems already using that database, right? So replacing that database means that you need to replace all of the software on top of that. And that's a lot of work, sometimes impossible to do. But uh, what we try to do in those cases is to get, you know, a graph database next to your traditional database and sign them together. So uh, many databases are able to send like uh, like a Kafka stream of mutations to so say, hey, mm -hmm. this has changed, this has changed. So you can keep the graph database up to date completely with, uh, with the relational database and then use the graph database for the things that graph database are good at, right? So a traditional example, if you have, you know, like you have a block system and you wanna fetch all of the comments for a given block and that was big data, right? Uh, that is actually really hard if you store it as, you know, a comment comments on something and that could be either a comment or a post. Uh, having to do that, it's going to be, you're going to have to have an extra index for sure, but you're basically going backwards into how relational databases work. So it's going to be really hard and not very performant. So you could use that to just keep the metadata of like all of the indexes inside of the graph database and then fetch all of the nodes or fetch all of the IDs of the things that you read, that you want, keep that structure, and then the metadata of the text and images and whatever is still in your relational database. So using as an index database that is going to enhance what you can build rather than having to replace the whole thing. That's that's totally a normal thing because, you know, if you go to a CTO and you're like, hey, I have this brand new database, replace yours with this one, they're going to be like, yes, no. no, no yeah, we're just going to control A and then delete on everything we've got. <laughs> That's yeah. all right. <laughs> Just store your data in this floppy disk and then we go from there. You know, yeah. <laughs> so if we if we actually looked, if we poked around in the files that are stored by dgraph then, what, what does it actually look like? I mean, it, what is it literally when it's on disk? What does it look like? So uh, you're going to see that there are uh, three directories, uh, P, W and ZW or ZW, depending on how wrong you say things in English. Uh, so <laughs> Z, yeah, I know, uh, zebra. Uh, so whatever, like, uh, so uh, the, the P is where all the data is going to be stored. Uh, so uh, you're actually going to have LSTM files. So basically what Badger stores. So it's a bunch of different key value stores represent an LSTM in disk, right? So you have a mm -hmm. bunch of those. And then you have uh, W, which is a write ahead log. So every single time an operation is sent to the database, they're gonna we're going to store it there, just in case it cra just in case it crashes, right? So if it crashes, then we can tell, oh, this is where we were. These are the operations that we need to keep on applying, right? And then there's one more folder, which is the ZW, and ZW is the zero write ahead log. So it's the write ahead log for the cluster itself. Is the zeros are the ones that manage the cluster themselves. So you're gonna have those three folders, and yeah, everything in that in in there, it's just you know binary uh, binary files. You could technically um, copy those and send them around and start a new database, uh, but the problem is that these files are actually uh, the way they work. They contain things like how many machines you have in your database cluster and things like that. So over time, if you change that probably you're going to end up having crashes and you know that's not the way to go but we also have things that you can export all of your data to json or rtf or even you have binary backups which store in uh, protocol buffers is a file system is the only way to store data or can i just write an adapter to just send it to like some blob store somewhere so uh, it needs to be, so the idea is that uh, badger the key value store is designed to work on ssds 
right? Mm -hmm. If you're not running on an SSD, it will still work, but it will be way slower, right? So yeah. uh, the idea is that SSDs need to be there. Uh, when you're doing a backup that, yeah, you can totally store that in like uh, in uh, cloud storage or whatever, that's totally fine. The, the interesting thing is there was actually uh, someone that was asking about how could they do it to store all the data in memory. And there's something that we're doing for Badger for the key value store. We're going to have the disk, disk class mode where you, everything is stored in memory and then you would be able to run everything on RAM which is not a great idea for a graph database that is supposed to store a lot of data. But if you have something really small that you want really high performance on, it's definitely something that you could try. Is it possible to use MFS uh, or do you have to like write a new adapter? Oh, yeah, it's already built. So uh, it's li like the what we're doing is not adding a lot of things. We're basically removing some checks that we had. Like there was some blocks that were storing disk and some small things that we had to remove. By default, yeah, we already have adapters to write everything directly in memory. You don't need to do anything. That's cool. So if, if the sorry, Johnny, if the data set, I don't know why I apologize to you because the listeners didn't know you had your hand up, did they? I think. <laughs> nope, it's hard. They didn't. This job is hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to top it off, I've forgotten what I was going to say. So over to you, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> what a great host. <laughs> I'm telling you. London calling. Okay. It's like there's a big delay as well. Although there isn't. This is amazing. <laughs> Sorry. We'll cut this bit out. I'm just, a, sometimes I just get amazed that technology works. So <laughs> this is one of those times. Johnny. No, this bit, this bit will be left in, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> Anything where I look stupid stays in. That seems to be the <laughs> policy. So, so uh, um, on episode one hundred three, actually, uh, we had um, some folks from from DGraph um, on the show. Um, we had uh, Manish and we had uh, um, Carl, Carl yeah. Aguirre, Manish Jane, um, and uh, they they we talked about uh, a lot of things, including sort of a, a ristretto. <laughs> I'm not. I'm sure I'm butchering that. A ristretto. Like <laughs> you can correct me when you <laughs> when you answer this. But uh, uh, what is what is uh, um, I, I believe the idea was to introduce. Um, like a, a really, really good cache that could serve, you know, um, sort of the needs of DGraph sort of under the hood. I'm in interested in hearing sort of the state of that transition and um, whether it's been done already or in how it's, how things are going, how things are performing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of, kind of interested in hearing about that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, yeah, technically you pronounce it, if you want to go Italian, you go ristretto, but uh, otherwise we'll say ristretto. And okay. uh, it's much easier. <laughs> and uh, so Ristretto is this caching mechanism that we're integrating at, a, at different levels. Uh, so one of the levels is actually in the key value store. We're going to have an integration with Badger directly. And the idea here is that uh, we've added uh, encryption and compression to the key value store, which makes it uh, harder on the CPU, right? So uh, when you need to decrypt things uh, before you can, you can read them, that's that's the CPU taking uh, extra cycles. So the idea is that by having a a, um, a cache, we will uh, make it be as fast as before by using a little bit more memory, right? Uh, then on top of that, we're also adding it at the at DGraph level, and uh, we're even thinking about using it at GraphQL level. So then we could have like caching at many different levels and trying to see what is the uh, the most performant option, right? Uh, the interesting thing about Ristretto is that running a cache in Go is actually really hard. Like, <laughs> it is surprisingly hard. Questions like, you know, if I give you a pointer to a struct that has a bunch of things, how much memory does it take in memory? Like, how much space does it take in memory? That is super hard to answer. What the point is that? No, not the, like what is behind the pointer, right? Like, you have a struct, but then, of course, the, it's the sum of the fields. Sure, plus aligning and things like that. And then what is the size of a map? Uh, well, you know, it's the size of all of the keys <laughs> plus some extra stuff. What is the size of a slice? Well, it's the array plus some extra stuff, right? So you get like plus some extra stuff in so many places that actually figuring out, given for instance, you know, if you have a, a, a JSON file and you want to parse it and say with, you know, certain accuracy, how big is this going to be once I pass it in memory? That is surprisingly hard. So when you're doing this for a cache, uh, if you don't get that right, the problem is that you cannot really tell whether this new object fits in memory or not. So should, should you drop something before you load this one or not? 
it is hard. Uh, and even gRPC, you know, it's like uh, gRPC works really well, but gRPC doesn't really do this either in Go. Uh, for C++, there's this concept of arenas where you can decode objects directly into a, a memory space. Mm. But uh, in Go, it doesn't do this. It doesn't support it, right? So all of these things like memory management in Go are surprisingly complicated, uh, which is fun. But also, it's like, <laughs> I've seen some issues that was like, I literally have no idea. I don't know how to help you with this. So good luck. And of course, yeah. no, none of your old Google friends will talk to you anymore. So yeah, you can't no. even ask them. <laughs> Why am I well. here on this show? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> good My <news>. God. <laughs> but yeah, all in all, you know, it's like uh, Restraddle, the whole idea is to, to make Badger better, DGraph better, and uh, being able to use memory in a way that compensates for the extra cost in CPU. Uh, but also at the same time, we wanted to make it open source so anyone can use it for whatever they feel like it. And it's it's pretty successful. Like it's a lot of people have been adopting it, uh, filing issues and uh, feature requests and things like that, which is really nice to see. Yeah, I'm actually using it now in a project. Uh, oh, nice. Think, yeah. It is great, and it's such a simple kind of uh, API as well. So it's and it's really easy to just plug in. And what's it's so satisfying when you suddenly just your application just gets extremely fast. It's very yeah. satisfying. I don't look at the RAM. I'll just get more RAM if I need some more RAM. That's my approach. But others <laughs> like like to be a little bit more scientific. Um, <laughs> it's just so how do you? Let's, I'll just spell that out then for anyone interested, and we will post these links in the show note. But it's ristretto, ristretto. <laughs> That's right, isn't it? R i s t r e t t o. Do you know what a ristretto is? At least. Is it a type of pasta? Uh, and that's not... I'm not being rude. <laughs> I, gen I genuinely... I genuinely... It's made me so, hungry. Because it sounds Italian, it's pasta? No, no, no. <laughs> no I, I thought it was. I thought it was. <laughs> no, a ristretto is like a is very, very coffee? short espresso. Oh, so it's like a yeah. tiny coffee. Yeah. Oh, that is, espresso that is, is already a tiny though, isn't it? Yeah, so a ristretto is even smaller. Yeah, it's like couple, it it's couple like drops of coffee. It's really. like, a, like an espresso for kids. I think that if you fed your no. kids ristretto, you end up with someone like you at the end. Like, I would not fed <laughs> ristretto like to my kids. Yeah, it's, <laughs> so it's like the like same amount of coffee, I think. It's like same amount of coffee, but it's like shorter. So it's like really dense, right? Oh, yeah. Wow. Like something wow. like that. It's compressed coffee. Yeah. Sorry, I got I got I got told off for suggesting it was pasta, but it turns out it's coffee. Come on. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but yeah, that's that's the the whole idea is to make something very small that works well. So Ristretto is a good name. Yeah, it, it is great. I recommend people try it. It's so easy to plug into your existing Go projects as well. Indeed. Thank you so much for educating us, Francesc. And what's the do, what's the domain name for people that want to find out more about what you're doing? So uh, dgraph.io, so D-J-R-A-P-H dot I-O. And uh, also before we finish, actually, I wanted to mention something. Uh, so uh, there's FOSDEM coming up. Uh, you may have heard about it. This uh, open conference in Belgium that happens in February 1st and 2nd, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I, this year, again, um, co-managing it with uh, Marge from uh, Marge Eiskens from uh, Women Who Go. So the CFP is open. So please apply. Uh, we want to have as many proposals as possible. So at the end, we'll get really good, high quality talks. Uh, they end up being giving to uh, given at a very small venue because uh, the conference is always super crowded and it's fun, but then also we end up with a very nice video. So, you know, even if it's your first time speaking, it's a great place to try it out. Uh, and also, uh, you know, you, you will have people helping you, uh, mentoring you, uh, reviewing your slides and helping you rehearse, whatever it needs. So, you know, uh, first time speakers, uh, totally welcome and actually encouraged to apply. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We will post all of these links in the show notes, so don't worry. And that leaves me, all that leaves is for me to say goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. All right. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of Go Time. If you're not yet, hang with us in Go for Slack. We have a channel called Go Time FM. Look it up. You'll find us. 
hang with us during the live shows, connect with other members of the community, share stories, share codes, share coffee recipes, whatever. It's a lot of fun. Also, we have discussions at changelaw.com on every episode. Head to changelaw.com slash go time, find this episode and discuss it with the community. Also, thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner, Rollbar, for helping us move fast and fix things, and Linode for hosting the Change Law platform. Our music is produced by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. And if you want to hear more awesome podcasts like this, subscribe to our master feed. It's one feed to rule them all, plus some extras that only hit the master feed. Head to changelaw.com slash master or search for changelawmaster in your podcast client. You'll find us. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.